Stay passionate about what you do. Don't follow anything that resembles fame or money or any of that stuff. Passion, right? right? Passion's free and it fuels us and it becomes the heart and soul of everything that we do. David, we're finally here. I've been excited about this here because I, I've known you for a while. And if I look at this beginning part, part this is like entrepreneur, award-winning music businessman, technologist, producer, engineer, publisher, author, and drummer, founder of Audio One and CEO of Frangioni Media and All Access IDA, inspire and develop artists. There is so much that I want to capture in this interview. Thank you. And I want to get to it all because this is inspiring. It is important for people to understand that someone like yourself has this incredible drive to be involved in many aspects of the music industry mm -hmm. and succeeded it at a high level all the time. So I want to make sure we capture this in the course of the process. So thank you so much for joining us. No, David. thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I, it's such an honor. Thanks. So thank you. So music enters your life. You're young. You're hit by the drumming bug. Yeah. I mean, around 18 months old, there's drums at the house. And I never realized how young I started until when my mom passed away in 2004. I was going through all these pictures and I found these pictures. I had always said, oh, I started drumming at eight because I remember being in elementary school and I remember very clearly the practice pads and the teachers and that, you know, kind of that beginning. Yeah. But it turns out when we went through photos, oh, I was amazing. 18 months old and it was right before, as my life will have turned out to have been so affected by that when I got retinoblastoma, when I was, when I was diagnosed with cancer of the eye and right. two right. in 1969, it turns out I was drumming a little before that. So it all kind of interweaved mm. that dealing with that trauma and, and all of the things that go with, you know, losing your, your right eye, losing sight in one eye, having a prosthetic, you know, there's a lot of elements to that, that affect your entire life and your family's life Absolutely. of course because my parents and i were very close mm -hmm. and so the drums been there forever how amazing so were there drummers that you were listening to as you got a little older were there influences that you had Absolutely. Um, you know, at first, Buddy Rich, it seems like <laughs> not, not only is the greatest drummer ever, it seems like it immediately is, you know, my parents who don't have a background, didn't have a background in music, yeah. right? They're blue collar, the most loving, supportive people. They're the whole reason we're sitting here without a doubt, yeah. but not from a musical or business sense, from a loving and supportive sense, which wow. in my case turned out to be even bigger and better for getting me through all of the challenges that maybe if they had had a different career path. But they were blue collar, family first. Their parents uh, were immigrants from Italy. Mm. I grew up in Boston where they landed and their families started from Italy through Ellis Island to Boston. Wow. You know, it started with saying, oh, if, you know, if you're really interested in the drums, listen to this drummer. <laughs> and, you know, they put on a Buddy Rich record and, you know, you just go, oh, my, you know, you don't know if you want to practice or quit. But really the main influence, as it turns out, as I was starting to, you know, become a little more aware of making choices in my own music and yeah. not just what my parents would play for me, right? Because I had no, you know, I was back, there's no internet at this time. We're in yeah. the 70s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, you only know what you see. Yeah. And what I saw was what my parents brought to me or what I was able to discover without driving or going anywhere really. And that was rock and roll. And so I was really into Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and these, you know, really great iconic rock artists and Carl Palmer as a drummer. Interesting. Carl Palmer had the same effect on me that Buddy Rich did. Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, huge. Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, yeah, which at yeah, the time, remember, yeah. they're playing stadiums. Yeah. They're really at the height of their career. Yeah, they they yeah. broke very big, very fast. Yeah. And it was, for me, it was like Buddy Rich, but with music that I enjoyed listening to even more because it was rock leaning yeah. right as they you know obviously everybody knows they call it prog rock yeah but you know emerson lake and palmer had the really intricate musical parts to it yeah. and then they had songs yeah. you know greg lake's actual songs like <laughs> lucky man and you know all these other you know from the beginning and you know just songs that you could listen to that was a blend for me yeah. and carl palmer yeah. was a huge yeah. influence and he had this really amazing drum kit that I saw on, first I heard it on the record and I knew 
it didn't sound like any of the other drummers. Mm -hmm. And it turns out because it was this stainless steel concert tom <laughs> kit. So it had incredible definition and projection. Yeah. And it turns out as I get more and more into this drum kit he's playing, I see a picture of it. And it's the most spectacular, inspiring kit that I'd ever seen. And this was a stainless steel made drum set. One of one. One of one. He had British steel make it. Yeah. He had a rifle collection and etched on all the butts of the rifles were these images. And so he got the idea, I'm going to have somebody etch images into the drums. Of animals like, right? Was, of animals. Yeah, and yeah. he had a drill with a dentist drill, <laughs> the images etched, which I couldn't see from the first record and picture that I saw. Right. Because the only access I had to the kit was whatever he, whatever photos ended up on an album right. that I could get right. my hands on. Right. And then Cream or Circus Magazine, right. which were the magazines of the day that I could get at the local newsstand. I would right. walk to the top of my block <laughs> in Arlington, Mass., and at Benny's newsstand, and I would just go there as often as I could to see, did you get a new magazine? And I would save up, and I would just scrap. And a lot of times I couldn't even afford the magazine, but he would let me read it. <laughs> and if it didn't have any pictures in it, I wouldn't try to hustle up how to get a couple of dollars to get the magazine. I'd just come back next month, and eventually I would get a picture here or a picture there and start to piece together what this kit really looked like. Because as it turns out, this kit was made on its own stands that didn't move right right so as carl would go on to to later talk about because the kit literally set up exactly the same way as if it were never broken down right. even though he was playing every night <laughs> in a different city all over the world his technique and his where he was going on the kit with his lightning fast chops and, yeah. and, and his and his incredible <laughs> drumming, right? One of the greatest drummers ever. Yeah. It just became unbelievable listening to him. And so that's what I was hearing. And then I'm seeing this. And you well know, uh, as drummers, the drum kit inspires us. Absolutely. Um, you know, and mo I think most drummers, I don't think all drummers are inspired by drum kits, but I think most drummers are really inspired by drum kits and Absolutely. i certainly was yeah. and am so that combination had a great effect so you're researching all this this this, this great you know this, this drum set you got this in your mind it's kind of etched in the back of your mind so from there you start going into playing with different other musicians where you're, you're jamming with people i was practicing my my parents have always been education first mm -hmm. in the perfect world i really believe is as proud of me as they were they wanted a doctor and a lawyer and they got <laughs> a doctor and my brother. <laughs> I have one sibling, my brother John is three years older than me, and yeah. he became a doctor. Fantastic. And of course he went to Harvard and did like exactly the dream Italian family, <laughs> you know, path. It was just, and so the, the opposite of that would be like a drummer and a musician. Like, God, why can't you be a lawyer and just complete the picture here? But that's not what was in my heart and soul. Yeah. So I was, but my parents were still even at now I'm seven, eight years old. And they're like, you gotta, you gotta act, take the right road. You're not just going to pick up sticks. You're going to learn. And if you don't want to learn the right way, then, then you're not that interested. Great. They were just so focused on education. Yeah. So I started, I uh, got a practice pad joined every elementary school band and lesson that there was. Then they saw that I was taking this very seriously, so they signed me up for a weekly lesson every Saturday at a local music center. Yeah. And I t learned drum kit, but I didn't have a drum kit. So they, they essentially kept testing how serious am I. And they would make that they would put that challenge down in a very loving way, but a very serious way. Yeah. So I got out phone books and other, you know, things to, to just emulate a drum kit because I had to go back to the lesson every week. Yeah. And how am I gonna you know, I gotta play and improve, but I don't have a drum kit, but the lesson's on drum kit. So oh, that was by yeah. do you know, foot on the floor yeah. and phone books. And yeah. I kept improving. And after a year, they went to the drum teacher and they said, Okay, what's going on with David? Is he yeah. Is he prepared every week? Does he have any talent? What should we do? And the drum teacher gave them encouragement. So they saved up and they bought me a used drum kit, a four piece pink champagne Rogers kit. <laughs> I wish I still had it. Of all the drum kits that I have, I don't have the one that, you know, one of the ones that was the, the beginning, but I have some pictures of my playing it. And that was the beginning. They surprised me with it. How beautiful. And it was just, you know, it's so impactful, Dom, when you have parents. I never took them for granted, but I but I never understood until I got older yeah. 
the level of impact yeah, that yeah. they have yeah. and had on my life. Yeah. Because our family was so all about family and loving, I, it, it just almost just became like breathing and, and eating and drinking that, okay, this is, and we were insulated, right? Yeah. So it was just, all we knew was like that there was this incredible love and support. Yeah. And they made everyday Christmas even with no means. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't because they bought fancy stuff because we didn't have the furthest thing from fancy. Yeah. But it was because they just made all the moments so great. And I remember when they got me my, my Rogers kit, they said, wait in your bedroom. And we had a small house the size of, it was a little bigger than this control room we're in. <laughs> and, uh, but it didn't matter. That was the house they had. They yeah. lived in it until they passed away. Wow. And that's where I grew up. Wow. I remember they said, wait in the bedroom. And I, it wasn't Christmas. And I'm like, and it wasn't my birthday. So I'm totally confused. What am I waiting in the bedroom for? And, and they snuck the kit in, set it up, and said, okay, you can come out now. And out of the blue sky, there's this kit. Incredible. And it wasn't an, it was probably cost them a couple hundred bucks, but it took them a long time to save for that. But it wasn't about any of that. It was about yeah. the fact that, wow, now I have my own drum kit. And I'm not going to be playing on pots and pans and yellow pages. What a moment. What a feeling of accomplishment. You know, it's interesting. Your parents sound like they didn't teach you love. They were too busy showing you. Exactly. And that's the power of Of, of doing know, of instead doing. of just talking. Absolutely. They and, were the example, not yeah. their words of advice. Right. They actually didn't talk a lot. Yeah. But their actions... How beautiful. How absolutely beautiful. And what a great message for even the viewers that watch this here to appreciate your parents and appreciate yes. what even what little they give you because in time you will look back at that and see the value of, of how beautiful it was. That's right. Yeah. And don't underestimate as a parent how much impact you really have. Yeah, yeah. It's huge. How amazing. You go on, you now you're... You're practicing, you're playing in your drum kit. And I'm finding, next step? I'm finding other musicians. So okay, now anybody is. who is interested in a guitar or bass can <laughs> sing. I don't care how good you are. I'm 10, 11 years old. I, just let's come to my basement and let's play. Yeah. And I was just putting bands together, playing in pickup bands. My brother, who I mentioned, is a doctor. But back then he played instruments for fun. Yeah. He put together bands. Sometimes I would play with his bands because being three years older, yeah. they were better. Yeah, right? Yeah. And then there was a local tribute bands, Elvis and the Beatles and this and that. Any, any place I could play. And I started to understand something really profound, like the, the combination of all the practicing with playing with other musicians, which was going to be how I could ever have a shot at getting close to Carl Palmer, <laughs> right? Because it was practicing alone, you can't do it. Right. And playing alone is the long way. Right. It's probably doable, but it's, it's going to take you 10 times longer. Right, right, right. So that combination was so powerful to Beautiful. learn. So I was putting together bands, and then I end up like booking my own bands, and I start to take on a business role that I'm not a, aware of. I'm not consciously thinking, I'm going to be a successful successful businessman and I'm going to, you know, buy at 50 and sell at 100. Like there's no concept of that. I just want to make sure we got gigs and that I can play as often as possible and that everything comes out right. Look at how natural that, that skill that you were learning was. It, it was. it was in the moment of survival Yes, that very really much. was the best teacher. Yes, survival and seeing the struggle my parents had to live. Yeah and seeing that they had a life that was what I think a, a, a depression era right. life kind of looks like, which right. is if we can get through this and we can have a roof over our head yeah. and we can be healthy enough to get from A to B. I, I won't even say have a car because yeah. we had one bad car. My mom took the subway and buses for most of her life to Incredible. work. Incredible. Yeah, it was. Yeah, when yeah, I look yeah, back, yeah. it was. And, yeah. I just wanted to make a bigger impact. I wanted to I wanted to have a life that could contribute more and could be more than what I saw. It, it was not the love was inspiring, but the environment wasn't. Yeah. And yeah, I didn't yeah. want to have to be confined to that. I wanted to be able to choose. Yeah. Okay, if I want to live like this, great. Yeah. But if I don't, I want to have that choice. Right. And I knew that I had to have success to do that. I needed to go further than where I was by a long shot. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I wanted to do that with something I loved to do. Because one of the other gifts of the endless amount of gifts my parents gave me in lessons 
one of them also was, well, any time you're not studying or practicing, you're working. <laughs> and what that looked like at a young age, of yeah. course, is, you know, you're working at a supermarket, or the Whatever. worst jobs, yeah. like the most uninspiring, <laughs> right. condescending, yeah. just, you know, but you out in working. the rain and the snow. But yeah. I was working, you're working because yeah. there was no... There was no downtime. Yeah. There was no concept of a day off. Right. Weekend, no gig, you're working. Mm. So I had these part-time jobs. My point is that it gave me a first-hand look at if I don't have an education and I don't have a purpose and I don't have success in, in what I'm going to do with what I love to do, this is what it will be. Yeah, right. right. And when you live it firsthand, yeah. that's a motivator. That's... I, I mean, I already had enough motivation <laughs> with the four o'clock in the afternoon, dark days in the freezing cold, shoveling snow and not having any money. Yeah. But this took it up even another notch. Yeah. And so it was like, no way. What? What? I'm going. Lessons. What great lessons. Huge great, lessons. Great lessons. And, and it drove me to be able to reach some heights that... Um, I never, even even in my dreams, I didn't think I would reach those heights. But it was just all a result of just relentless work and focus, not taking anything for granted, and knowing that if I don't, if this doesn't work, I know where where I'm back to. Right. And uh, you know, it's uh, it was it was really effective. So where was the next step from that? From this point on, what was the, what was the next step that moved you forward? I'm playing in all these different bands and. I started studying with, I, I was looking for next level teacher. And my routine was, I would look and see, uh, we had a b newspaper in Boston called the Boston Phoenix. Yeah. And I would get it every week and it would show you the gigs that were available. And it would show you who's playing at the clubs and, at, and, and who's gonna be in town. Yeah. So my routine was looking for gigs, <laughs> practicing, making sure I did well in school, cause I'm in high school now. Yeah and searching out all the drummers that were coming to town and going and sneaking into the gigs because they were all old. I couldn't get in, oh, yeah, so absolutely. I had to sneak in every yeah. gig. <laughs> and so, and I would borrow my brother's ID. But see, another blessing of being in clubs really early, playing in the bands that I'm referring to, I'm 10, 11, 12, 13, yeah. is that I was so turned off by drinking and smoking that I've never had a puff of a cigarette, any kind of drug, from marijuana on up or Fantastic. down or however you want to look at it, yeah, never yeah. had it, even tried it once and never had alcohol. Hmm. Maybe a toast, champagne, one little sip yeah. at New Year's. But there's zero alcohol in my body. Oh, fantastic. And so fantastic. all of that was, again, learned very early. Yeah. Huge lesson, huge blessing. So as I'm going to the clubs and I'm seeking out drummers and I'm getting to the gig early and I'm finding that drummers like Louis Belson and Billy Cobham, <laughs> they're setting their own drums up. So I help them. And then they would give me a lesson and I would start to know them. And the next time they came into town, I would be waiting there for them to sh get off the elevator at the gig and I would help them and they'd show me another lesson. I became friends with them. I went out to lunch with Louis several times. How beautiful. And, and it was amazing. Yeah. So I was really getting inspired and getting close to all of these iconic drummers that were coming to town. Yeah. I had no reservations. I called up Tony Williams, found out <laughs> where he was staying. You know, and I didn't care if he said, no, I won't give you a lesson. Yeah. I just had to try. And so in a more formal way, I sought out a local teacher. And so in addition to all my club going and sit, you know, getting there four in the afternoon, helping the drummer, taking the lesson, standing stage left, so I'm at, I'm right parallel with the hi-hat, yeah. every gig, Best both view. sets, they would say, hey, another 20 bucks for you to stay, and somehow <laughs> I'd scrounge up the 20 bucks and I'd stay, I'd watch the whole night, and I'm learning and learning and learning and being blown away by these drummers, because yeah. most of them were playing small places, right, but iconic drummers. Yeah. I sought out um, a local drummer teacher to take to the next level, and I found Alan Dawson who lived, right, we know Alan, of course, and yeah. legendary teacher, so I studied with him. Beautiful. The fact that he taught Tony and he was such a great teacher, so yeah. he took me pretty far, and now I, I, my dream was to always study with Joe Morello. So mm. like, really my drumming dreams were rooted, and don't ask me exactly how, yeah. but from an early age, Joe Morello and Carl Palmer. 
Those were like my, inf my, my inspirations. Well, just to have someone like Alan Dawson. I mean, Alan Dawson was a phenomenal player and, and a teacher. phenomenal educator. He yes. was a professor at such a high level. Yes. And, and he stayed at my house several times, and I had some lessons with him also. And he was always, there was a philosophical approach that Alan had that was very inspiring. So the fact that you had that at a young age, this is huge. It was huge. Yeah. And it, and it, and it put the fuel in my tank for... I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be a great drummer. <laughs> and I never really thought I was that great. Like, I always felt like I had so far to go, but I wasn't going to stop trying yeah. and practicing and, and just seeking out education. To, to, to me, education is the best investment you'll ever make in yourself because when it's done right, it saves you enormous amounts of time and you advance. And then from that advancement, you're able to advance even further. Yeah. And it's like exponential, yeah, right? As yeah, you know better yeah. than anybody is the world's <laughs> foremost drum teacher. You, I'm not telling you anything you don't yeah. know. That's your whole life has been powerful. dedicated very, to very it. Powerful, yeah. And I learned that early and, and applied it. So I went, so as I'm going from Alan Dawson to Joe Morello, I get every issue of Modern Drummer and I'm waiting at the back of the issue for Joe Morello to accept students again. Because as we know from the day, yeah. he would put an ad whenever he had openings Absolutely. in the back of Modern Drummer. Absolutely. And the first thing I did when I saw that is I called him up and I, and I drove five hours each way to New Jersey from Boston, took a three-hour lesson, which I convinced him to give me, yeah. and I would drive back because I couldn't even afford a hotel room. <laughs> But I could just afford the lesson for scraping together the, between the supermarkets and uh, the you know playing the gigs for twenty bucks a year. I mean, I wasn't making any money at it, but I put it all together and I was able to take the lesson every whatever interval it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in that moment of time, now I'm in my teens, and I'm in my pursuit of being a, a professional drummer. I find electronics because in the mid '80s now. Drumming and electronics is starting to become really pretty important. Start, yeah, absolutely. Really between drum good. machines yeah. and triggering. Right. And then, of course, I saw and heard Dave Weckl with the Chikoria Electric Band and all the f amazing cutting-edge things he was doing yeah. and applying it. You yeah. take a drummer at that level, another huge influence of mine, Dave Weckl, absolutely. as a drummer and as, as a technology person. And so that combination was like the perfect storm for me. And I remember studying really hard at like learning all about technology. And I would go to Joe Morello and I would say, uh, Joe, you know, um, I, I know we finished our lesson. I'm, I'm learning these things about MIDI. And he's like, MIDI? Walter MIDI? Is that a guy? That, is it, is it, doesn't he have a movie out? I said, no, not MIDI. MIDI. M-I-D-I. He's like, keep practicing. And so I was like, okay. I, it's, that you was know, so out of Joe's Yeah, it, was, it yeah, really yeah, was. Yeah, but I was yeah. so excited about yeah, it. Yeah. And he could see the passion in it. And he's like, wow. He's like, you know, you have this passion towards this that I've only seen in you when we talk about the drums. Yeah. So what do you think that was? What, 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 was, what about technology that, that, that sucked you into this world? It was a calling dump. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer for it because yeah. as a kid, yeah. on like, you know, C++ basic computers and that kind of thing, I was a disaster. Yeah. It was just, it was like math to me, yeah. which for math to me was something that I just, I, I didn't like. Yeah. I, I, I knew I needed to understand it and learn it, yeah. but there were kids sitting next to me like, oh, we're going to learn about calculus, <laughs> you know, next level algorithms. And I'm just like, oh. what, you know, wh wh I, oh. no, I mean, the math to me was like understanding 4-4 four, four to 5-4 to 7-8, <laughs> right, back to 4-4. Four, four. That was enough math. With technology and music, yeah. And the combination seems so limitless. Mm. And everything you could hear in your head and everything you could hear musically, how to apply that technologically. And the blessing for me with technology was, was definitely finding my calling. Mm. But the blessing in it was that by the time I found it, and I'm still young, yeah, but yeah. I had studied music so long at that age. Right now I'm 17 but I had been studying it since I was two and taking lessons, reading music since I was seven or eight. I went to Greater Boston Youth Symphony Orchestra and got into that orchestra, Gypso, they called it. Ended up meeting a lifelong friend of mine, Jim Riley, who's now the drummer and musical director for Rascal Flatts. Yes. But we were both in Gypso together. That's how we met. <laughs> so we're playing these orchestral pieces. I met Vic Firth through that. All these amazing, inspiring people. But the education that I'm getting, understanding music, at that level where I can read it and I can write it and I can play it. Now when I got to music technology, 
I had such a depth of understanding of the music side of it Beautiful. that for me it was like just right. like spontaneous combustion, like boom, like wow, look at the possibilities here. They're so you're, endless. You're, you're bouncing both both areas now. You're bouncing this musical artistic level and this technology area. Yes. So which which area started to spawn more to grow? Without the next a doubt, level? the music technology. Because what ends up happening is I end up falling in love with it as much or more than drumming. Interesting. So now I'm thinking to myself. Some of it's subconscious because, you know, in hindsight now, it be everything becomes a lot more clear, right, yeah. when we look at it. And yeah. in the moment, it's a little different. But what was happening when I look back is that I'm thinking to myself, dr full-time drummer, my parents are saying, be a lawyer, be a lawyer, don't come home at four in the morning every night, you know, don't, you smell like smoke, even though you don't smoke, like this is horrible. Yeah, yeah. And I'm watching all these bands that I'm in and out of, and I'm thinking, wow, I get in a band, and we get close to success or hit success and the lead singer leaves, I'm done. Yeah. I'm back to square one. Like yeah. I'm putting a lot of logic into this Interesting. career choice. Interesting. And I'm scared to death yeah. of yeah. it. Yeah. And because I didn't I didn't have enough vision to see that there would have been other possibilities, right? I saw it as you're gonna be a famous drummer or you're gonna be a bum. Hmm. And if you become a famous drummer, you're gonna live like a lifestyle that you really have to enjoy that yeah. lifestyle or yeah. you're just not going to enjoy Absolutely. being a famous drummer. Absolutely. Just the way it is. Absolutely. And I didn't like that lifestyle. I didn't mm -hmm. like traveling 300 days a year, you know, being on the road and, and just the whole being out, having nights instead of days and all of that yeah, stuff was yeah. just very foreign in my family. Yeah, and it yeah. just, it was hard to adjust to. Very different. To. Very yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when I found technology, I genuinely love it and loved it then mm. and realized, wait a second, all of these dreams that I have of working with the musicians that I look up to, they're going to be realized through my contributions of what I know in music and what I know in technology, mm. but they never would be realized as a drummer because when I look back and, you know, Aerosmith and, you know, the Stones and Shakira and Brian Adams and all these, Ricky Martin and all these amazing artists that I've had the privilege of working with, they have a drummer, right? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. they, they have. So when I look back, it wasn't conscious like I thought, oh, I've cracked the code on this, but that's how it turned out. And I look back and I go, wow, like all of my dreams yeah. were realized, but just not as I saw them as a kid. <laughs> I was like behind the drums with all these guys. <laughs> but now I'm like it, with the technology and I'm enjoying it even more and I'm contributing in ways that I never even imagined because the technology is so limitless. And when you can mm, apply yeah, it, yeah. But it seems like when passion is so deep, that fate seems to guide us in a way that, that works the path comfortably for us to make decisions that can take us to a place that we would have never thought we would go to before. Exactly. So here you are now. So now, explain about now you're working with these different artists. How did you end up working with these artists? Well, the music technology, what ends, what ends up happening with the music technology is I start a consulting business and I learn and absorb myself in it to the yeah. point where it consumes me. Right. And all I'm doing seven days a week is everything and anything to do with music technology. Right. So I start consulting and then I would start getting local gigs in Boston. And then I got referred to Aerosmith mm -hmm. and I started working with them. And that became a full-time project, right? right? Was where I kind of never left um, and still do projects with them to this day. Yeah. But in the 90s, from like 89 to 2001... It was all the time. That was their most active time when they were working in the studio yeah. and they were working on a lot of new music and soundtracks and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So Aerosmith, what, what was the next step from there? Well, within Aerosmith, I was getting a lot of referrals and I was working really hard around Boston just when they were on the road. If I wasn't working on a specific project for them, I would get other referrals and do other projects, build studios for people. Now I had evolved from just doing individual technology programming and rigs and teaching right. and setups to full-blown studios through just learning so about you're building it. Studios. So you're now I'm building full, full-on studios for, for songwriters yeah. and artists mostly. This is like the gold rush time, yeah, right? Where yeah. everybody wants a studio all of a sudden. It's, yeah. You know, it's very different today as we sit here. Right. But in, mm -hmm. at that time, it was, you know, I was credited, I think it was with Chick Corea, kind of building the first home studio. Whether that's true or not, who knows? But yeah. it was early days. And that just built up yeah. where I went from working with Chick to Aerosmith to, you know, to these different artists. And I was very busy. And so I had to start a company. I, I really, I needed a way to scale 
what I was doing one artist at a time mm. to something that could that was capable of of doing multiple artists. So I started a company called Audio One, and that company's early days was building studios for artists, songwriters, etc. And then that evolved to the home technology world, mm. where artists would say, "Well, you know." Because now we're, I'm building it up and we're in the mid-90s and artists are starting to think about home theaters and smart home automation is starting to come into you know, its own a little bit. And the type of artists or songwriters in a lot of cases with whom I was working were mm. successful. They had the ability financially to say, hey, if I have this creative idea and I want my house to have lighting control, I can have it. So I was someone who could provide that and was very inspired and passionate about that as well. So you saw branching out. Branched out. So yeah. Audio One became one of the largest companies in the world for home automation, home theater, and recording studios starting mm -hmm. in the 90s. Incredible. So now you're building this up. You've got, you're in this by yourself. You have people working with you. How, how, was, how was the business built? Well, I had a partner. That partner was strictly finance and you know, accounting and CFO right. and, and, you know, some marketing. But for the most part, I was the, you know, the vision behind this is where the company's going. This is how we're going to get our projects done. Okay. This is the technology we're going to take on. Okay. And then I was doing a lot of other projects along the way. So I had Audio One and I had my work with Aerosmith. And then I started to, I did sample uh, drum library CDs, uh, I, I hooked up with Doug Rogers from East West very early on. Yeah. Uh, we did Pro Samples 5, which now they're probably at Pro Samples 5 million, right? <laughs> but back then it was Pro Samples 5. It was yeah. right after Bob Clearmount and did a library with them. And as a technologist, and I called Doug up and I said, you know, I'm really a huge fan of the work that, that you're doing with East West. I have the Clearmount Library. It's phenomenal. Everything you guys do is great. I said, if there's ever an opportunity, you know, I, I program and I have sounds. He goes, well, send me some of your stuff. And the FedEx arrived there at like 10.30 the next day. I, it was a DAT that I sent him, a DAT tape. And at like 10.40, my phone rang. Hmm. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Like, yeah. usually that's good news. Yeah. And it was. He called me up. He goes, David, I'm five minutes into this DAT tape. He goes, we're, we're doing a project together. Yeah. And we end up doing Dance Industrial 1. It sold so well, became one of the biggest sellers of all time, yeah. that we did Dance Industrial 2. And then <laughs> I wanted to go a different direction, so I brought Steve Smith in, <laughs> and I produced, co-produced with Doug, the th my third library, which was Rhythmic Journey, yeah. which Steve Smith played the loops. Yeah. <laughs> we brought Kevin Elson in, who produced the Journey Records, and he recorded it at Fantasy, where they did the Journey Records. And it was just a really cool project. Oh, great man. loops, great sounds. And then I went on and did another one with Todd Zuckerman called More Than Sticks. Mm -hmm. And then with Brian Fraser Moore and our friend Jim Riley, yeah. I did uh, Groove for Life. Uh, I did some libraries. And so that's kind of stuck with me my whole life. Another wow, thing incredible. that when I found it, here it was, my passion for drumming and rhythm and putting drums in music combined perfectly with technology because mm. it was very much a technology project. And it ended up being used on dozens and dozens of successful records, all these loops. And that was just another, you know, that was something else I was really passionate about as I'm building Audio One and learning more about the different facets, technology, yeah. studios, recording, home automation, home theater, any one of these, Dom, is a full-time, dedicated life. And Absolutely. I just did all of them, but that's all I did. It was all-consuming. It was way out of balance. <laughs> Your balance chart would be on fire right now going, damn it, what are you doing? But that's what it looked like for me, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. But your drive, your drive is, is so inspired. I mean, here you are just seeing opportunity and you're just going for it. It's not even about sleeping or eating. It's about just keep on right. going forward right. and move this machine because there's great opportunity there. So you seize the moment of opportunity. I did. I was really passionate about what I was doing. Yeah. It, it was opportunity but it was the opportunity to do things that I loved yeah. and make a living, which is when we look back at my childhood, that was my big yeah. goal. Yeah. It was like, I don't, my dad, God bless him, Silviano was a meat yeah. cutter wow. and, a, and a cook, and he loved that. I mean, we have literally chef knives on his gravestone. Oh, like he gosh. was into it, yeah, yeah. but it was, it, it was his calling and it was a very simple life 
that contributed to what he was passionate about mm -hmm. in local restaurants or whatever. Yeah. I just wanted to do, I wanted to have a different life. Yeah, how absolutely beautiful. So, so you've got so, so many areas, the, the drumming, the pro side, artist development, the Frangioni Foundation, there's so many, the, the podcast as a collector, the home, the audio one, the audio swag, you've got so many things that you're doing. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you balance all of this? Having good time management, okay. being very efficient, yeah. Staying focused, mm -hmm. having great teams, yeah. that's huge, right? So you putting, can't do all of these companies without great teams. You need great people. Good people together that are yeah. together, yeah. Yeah, who are like-minded. Yeah. I remember Steven Spielberg said once, I only hire people that think like me. Yeah. And then you look at the output of brilliant work that he's Absolutely. created and how many people go into a film. Yeah, yeah. And so my companies are tiny compared to that, you know, but it's the same concept. You gotta have great people and, um, and you gotta lead them. Yeah. You know, there's great saying, uh, management is not abandonment. Yeah. Uh, and I really believe that that's really, really crucial. Yeah. Sometimes I'm too hands-on. Uh, but I'd rather make sure that where the ship is sailing is exactly where it's going. Because every time in my career, and Steven Tyler taught me this early. Mm. He was a big mentor, taught me a lot. Because remember, when I start working with them, I'm 20, 21 years old. Yeah, so yeah. very still, my brain's still forming. Yeah. So he, and he would always say, don't assume, do. Mm. And it sounds so simple, and to understand it is simple. Yeah. But to do it, especially when a lot of things are happening, yeah. is requires a lot of focus yeah. and a lot of persistence. And you've got to actually make the call. Everybody just loves to say, I say, you know, is, is this ready to go? Yep. And then I, I'll dive in a little deeper. How do you know? Oh, because they told me on Tuesday it would happen. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. Get on the phone right yeah, now yeah. and find, and nine times out of 10, yeah. it's not ready to go. So it was going to be ready to go, but it's not now. The follow-up is really important. You got you to really have that degree of following up and staying on top yes. of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you got to follow up yeah. and you, you, you've got to only be happy or satisfied, if you will, or accepting of the result. Right. The process only exists to get to the result. Results, not reasons. Right. The reason I think a lot of times that results aren't achieved when I see, when people come to me for consulting, right? Because yeah, yeah. I've gotten to the point now where people will ask for my advice right, and right. want to save time. That's part of the artist development you mentioned. Yes. And one of the things I can really bring a lot of value for is take all of these pitfalls that keep happening that they don't even realize that they're falling into mm. because there's so many assumptions that it gets to the point where you can't even find the first assumption, mm. but it's all subconscious. And so it's really, really critical mm. to the follow-up is to get to the means to the end. So if, if the end result is that this product needs to be on a shelf at Target, then when it's on the shelf at Target, <laughs> then then we're good. Yeah. You know, yeah. now we go on to the next phase. Right. Now what do we need to do that it's on the shelf? Yeah. But getting it to the shelf, you'll just find there's so many, you know, forks in the road and so yeah. many places where if you don't follow up and you don't stay resilient, because it's not just follow up, it's also resilience. Yeah. And it's also never taking no for an answer. I had someone work for me once as a GM at one of my companies and they, and they called me 10 years after they worked for me and they said, I just wanted to call to tell you that you changed my life. Mm. And for the last 10 years, my entire life's been different than all the time prior to meeting you because I never ever applied the don't take no for an answer until I met you. <laughs> and I never realized how critical it was in achieving the goals that I have to be as unreasonable as you are. How beautiful. And I said, amen. I beautiful. said, you got it. And congratulations because you got it. You cracked the code on it. Boy, I hope the listeners really kind of take this in and, 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 and rewind this last few seconds and hear that again. Because it's it an important part of it. You know, Frangioni Foundation, I mean, you, you give back. I mean, so, so now that you're involved with all these different things in the publishing, which we'll get into also, but talk about the Frangioni Foundation. Well, it's a nonprofit. It's a foundation that exists to bring drumming to other foundations, mm -hmm. education, programming, a museum, all as part of our way of getting kids to have opportunity through music mm -hmm. and specifically drumming that they wouldn't otherwise have. Right. And so I'm, you know, I'm based in Miami now. I've been here for over 20 years and there's a lot of foundations in Miami. Yeah. So I didn't want to start another foundation 
to do the exact same thing that everybody's right. doing because yeah. it just seemed ridiculous, yeah. right? You're yeah. like, they're already doing it. Yeah. So what do I love to do? How can I contribute but fill a hole, fill mm. a void, so that we really are contributing and we really are helping? And that was drumming. No mm. one was taking specifically drumming and applying it to Make-A-Wish or Little Dreams or IRE Foundation mm. or Musicians on Call or all these foundations that I've been involved in at different levels. Yeah. And now Frangioni Foundation can supply the drumming side of it. So I brought in a world-class educator, Don Femularo <laughs> and Joe Bergamini, and you guys helped me with some of the programming. Yeah. I don't know if you realized yeah. at the time that was for Frangioni Foundation, but it certainly is Fantastic. and was. Uh, so we have programming, we'll do master classes, uh, we've had PBS come in and film different kids. We had a child with autism Fantastic. who uh, they filmed a segment on and we did a little drum duet. And there's just, just so many areas where we can plug into inspiring and helping children. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And it, it's such a positive, healthy, and the drumming community really needs it too, just in the, in the help of what it is. Publishing. So now, how did Modern Drummer fall into place? They contacted me. They asked me if I would be interested in being a part of the magazine. And of course, I've been reading it since issue one. It's yeah. been a huge part of my drumming life, yeah. an iconic brand. Yeah. I didn't even know what to make of it. Like, what do you mean you want me to be part of it? Yeah. But it turns out that they had a view like, okay, we are a magazine that has analog roots. Yeah. And we, were, we started when you filled out postcards to subscribe. Right. Right. And yes, they've grown and they've done tremendously well. But they looked at me, as it turns out, as like, well, who is a drummer that's not a full-time drummer, yeah. but has the passion of a full-time drummer, <laughs> and the experience of a full-time drummer, yeah. but has technology in their roots and bones, which is where the magazine really needs to go, Absolutely. how it's going to get, the vehicle for getting there is all yeah. in technology. Yeah. That's what they're asking themselves behind the scenes, and I was recommended by our dear friend, Billy Amendola, yeah. and he said, well, I, I think I've got that guy. Yeah. And Isabel Spagnardi, Ron's wife, mm. and who's taken the magazine over since his passing, yeah. You know, she met with me and uh, she said, Billy, you're right. Let's, let's, let's try to bring David on. And we yeah. came to a, a deal and here we are. And uh, it's a great honor. I mean, it's, it's another pinch me moment. You know, there's, been, there's a few, you know, Absolutely. you know, probably most of them because we've got to be friends. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, yeah. you know, you are my modern day Joe Morello teacher. <laughs> so thank you for that. So it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a big part of my life. It's so exciting to work with you because here you are still as a constant student. As we work mm. together with lessons and mm. we're Skyping or meeting wherever yeah. we are, you're still studying. You're still finding the time. You're still making the time to push yourself with the instrument. And it is so exciting to see because the growth is obvious and it takes time and you're mm. putting in that time within the intense schedule that you have. Yeah, it's not easy. This but, is incredible. But it's a priority. And well, it's finding the right teacher. And I'm not just saying this because you're here. Yeah. Uh, you've heard me on interviews and many of the people who will watch this have heard me on other interviews. And that's the first thing I'll say. It's, is, it's finding the right teacher and mentor. And the next teacher that I have mm. after Joe Morello is you. Wow. I literally, when Joe passed away, and long before he passed away, when I got into technology and I stopped studying with him, there were moments where I wanted to go back to studying with him, but he had passed away. Yeah. Um, and, uh, or was unavailable, or I was unavailable. It just never worked. Yeah. The next time in my life that I wanted to revisit that and really, before I die, mm. I don't know how much longer I have, right? Yeah. But I, I just yeah. know that up until that moment, I just want to play at a certain level. Yeah. I want to be able to play musical ideas and realize that contribution and that inspiration through the instrument that I love. And I couldn't find anybody. Yeah. And you were literally the only person that I found that could really take me from where I left off with Joe yeah. to where I want to go. And that's... You know, that's a great honor. And that, that's what's so amazing is with how you structured your career and your life and taking the teachers that you took in yeah. Chapin and Stone yeah. and Morello <laughs> and Shelly Mann and yeah. like how yeah. you yeah. have now, and we need to do that. That was another inspiration behind my wanting to be on board with Modern Drummer. Yeah. It's like, okay, we have a vehicle and a voice now where we can reach all of these drummers at every level. Boy, we can we take really, the misinformation yeah. out yeah. and yeah. we can give them the next generation Dom Femularo because that's the only way that these tried and true techniques are going to survive and they have to survive. You know, these great it's masters, too important. It, it's so amazing. And, and Modern 
drummer as a vehicle to reach everyone in this planet yeah. that plays drums. It's really it has that reach for what it is. Yeah. It's a very very exciting journey. Talk about talk about now your books. Now you got involved with the Clint Eastwood books in, in, in what you've done. Talk about that and then and then well, crash. Well, we have Clint Eastwood Icon, yeah, which is my first book, um, which I'm very very proud of. It published by Insight Editions. Um, and that was in 2009. Mm -hmm. And uh, ba basically, I mean, I have, I had this collection of Clint Eastwood movie posters and memorabilia. <laughs> that you know, these are all these posters that of are all original yeah. from his films. And I just wanted to do something that I thought, you know, what do, what do you do with a collection, right? <laughs> Other than just look at it yourself and show some of your friends, which I don't have any friends, so, <laughs> so I was looking at it myself. My mom had passed away, and I had a great golden retriever. Now what am I going to do? And so Shoot. I had this collection, and I thought, I want to... I, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, and they said to me, you know, write a book. I put it in a book. Yeah. And I just went, ah, ah book. Like, <laughs> now another thing? <laughs> now I'm going to write a book? Right? Like, it seems like I got enough on my plate. But I, I thought about it and I said, you know what? That is that is the way to go. Yeah, that's, yeah, how I'll, yeah. that's how this collection will outlive me, which is really its only purpose. Right. Like, you know, who? what are you going to do with a collection? Yeah. So that's what started it. Long story on the book that I won't bore you with because, you know, <laughs> publishing a book, I, if a I sell, task. it is. And you yeah, know better than anybody. You've yeah. got dozens of yeah, them. Yeah. I didn't want to self-publish. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, to go the route like an artist would go with a record label where right. you get signed and the label is yeah. essentially who's producing the record and right. paying for it. Right. I wanted the same thing with the book. So yeah. I went the traditional route of seeking a publisher. Yeah. And, of course, that is the same thing as getting signed by a label. It's Absolutely. very hard. Absolutely. They're very, very picky. Uh, it was a, it was a road that I, you know, I was, I worked really hard to find yeah. the right publisher, f get them, get one to sign me, which Raul Goff from Inside Editions had the vision, yeah, and he signed me. Diana Ahn, a dear friend of mine, and Justin Lee, who's also a dear friend of mine, like a brother, they were instrumental in connecting me with Raul. They saw the vision of the book, Incredible. got the book published, got Clint Eastwood involved. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then in 2018, we did the expanded and revised edition. Right. Right? So that was even more, you know, mo more movies, more items. Um, just a really great uh, Incredible. project. Incredible. And then at the same time, Raul said to me, okay, we did the first icon. We'll do a revised and expanded. He said, what else do you have for ideas? And I said, a third book? And he, and he said, yeah, and we'll do them at the same time. They released them two months apart. Incredible. And the third book took the drum sets we've been talking about. Well, this is now the story we will uh, which, is, which are the drum kits from Frangioni Foundation. Yeah. So this is like the book that when you're at the museum and you buy the tour book or the guide book, right? right? <laughs> this is the book that takes you around the kits. And it's all kits with all these drummers. Um, that are you know I'm inspired by and it's crashed the world's greatest drum kits and it's become a bestseller, um, and it and actually at the time you know the crazy thing is you look and you see Modern Drummer. Yeah, absolutely. This is before I was publisher. Interesting. Is that I went to Modern Drummer and I said, I'm a huge fan of your magazine. How about if we do some collaboration on this? If I need some photos or whatever, let's work together on. I brought them into the project. Interesting. And now it the. Tables turned, and that had nothing to do with my becoming <laughs> publisher. But how bizarre is that? Again, fate was speaking loud and clear. Is, is what really what happened? Yeah, and as you <laughs> and as you said before, the passion yeah. when it becomes so ingrained yeah. that it's it provides that deep of a fuel, yeah. then it's almost unstoppable, and you don't even know where it's going to necessarily take you. So you just dream as big as you possibly can and, and do the work and then whatever's in store is going to happen. You have clearly done that now. we got to talk about the actual foundation of, of all these drum kits now. Just tell a story about now just in, a, in, a, in a, a brief way with all these kits and the Carl Palmer kit. Carl Palmer kit we talked about earlier in the interview. Yeah. Stainless steel kit. <laughs> as I'm growing up, I'm totally you know in love with this kit as just on uh, how it looked, how he played it, the whole thing. I, I'd show pictures of it to my mom. Uh, always my best friend and my inspiration. So everything yeah. I did was to her. Yeah. And I would say, Mom, this kit, look at this kit. And I'm going to have this kit someday. She <laughs> just went, oh, David, it's so good to dream. We can barely afford to pay attention. And and here here you are, you know, you're gonna, we're going to have this kit. So as the time goes on, the kit gets sold to Ringo Starr. 
And so my mom has a, she loves ribbing me about that. She's like, <laughs> oh, now, you know, it wasn't enough that a, a wealthy London rock star, right? they had never been to London. It was just some place on TV. None of us had been to London. This rock star has it. Now the wealthiest drummer in the world has it. So it's not just Carl Palmer anymore. Now it's Ringo Starr. Yeah, you're really going to get that kit. So time goes on. The drum kit's always in the back of my mind. Uh, clearly, many other priorities exist that, you know, I, I'm not following it quite as closely, but yeah. I end up working for Ringo and building studio for him and doing some music technology work. Of course, that's a huge honor, and I can't believe I've, I've lived and worked with a Beatle. It ends up that uh, I'm able to f ask him if he would sell the Carl Palmer drum kit. And of course, he says no. <laughs> no, he, Carl, he doesn't even remember he has it. Like, are you out of your like? What the heck are you talking? You're out of your mind. And I was and am out of my mind. So, uh, so that so that opportunity comes and goes. And now we're in the early 2000s. And now I've been following the kit. The kit was made, I think, in '75, right? So I'm following it all this time. And then, in 2015, again, Dom, I can't. It's like when you asked, like, why did why were there drums at your house when you were 18 <laughs> months old? Why in 2015 did I pick up the phone and call one of Ringo's guys and say, "Look, it's been 15 years or so since I asked about the kit." I figure enough time's gone by that I'm not driving you crazy. <laughs> uh, what, any second thoughts on the kit? Why 2015? No idea. They go, as a matter of fact, that drum kit is going in an auction. I said, what? <laughs> I said, what auction? They said, Julian's auction. I said, oh my God, as a collector, <laughs> I know Darren Julian, the principal of Julian's Auctions. Great guy, yeah. visionary in that world. Yeah. So I call him up, I give him the whole story, retinoblastoma, remove my right eye, <laughs> kit inspired me, helped me through my journey, worked with Ringo. I finished the stories literally sweating. <laughs> and he goes, David, you have to have this kit. I said, yes, that's what I'm talking about, Darren. I said, so you'll sell me the kit? And he goes, no, I'll get you a bidder number. <laughs> I said, oh, come on, this is, this is never going to end. So, you know, he said, look, the kit's been consigned. There's nothing I can do. I can't sell you the kit. Yeah. I, I'd love to, but you got to participate because it's already in motion. We have yeah. catalogs printed, like the, the horse has left the gate, as yeah. they say. <laughs> so I participate in the auction. I end up winning the kit. It's on the front cover <laughs> of the book. I end up being introduced to Carl Palmer. Turns out to be a great friend of yeah, mine now. Yeah. And we, we play on stage together in a drum duet. <laughs> and we record the show as a tribute to Keith Emerson and release a DVD of the show that Carl and I mix and co-produce <laughs> that we're drumming together on oh stage. Oh, my gosh. How do you even... This is, this is movie material. I mean, this really is. I've seen the kit. It is an amazing work of art. Thank you. It yeah. really is an amazing yeah, work of awesome. art. It's just gorgeous. It sounds great. It looks great. It felt great to play it. So it's an amazing story on how you've gone full circle with your passion and your drive and your perseverance, your dedication, your discipline. All of these words are absolutely important words that, have, that make up De Frangioni. It really is amazing to see all these qualities that you continue to, 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 to move forward. It's Thank you. absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. We have these young musicians that are listening to these interviews and they, they're inspired by what you're speaking about. In closing, what would you say to this next generation of what they would need to understand about how you've succeeded and continue to succeed in what you're doing, David? What would, advice would you give them to, to give them that hope for them to reach their dreams? Well, first of all, stay passionate about what you do. Don't follow anything that resembles fame or money or any of that stuff. Mm. Follow what you really, what you would do if it were free. Mm. Passion, right. right? Passion's free and it fuels us and it becomes the heart and soul of everything that we do. And, it, and it's the thing that gets lost so much through people's youth and through all the noise and the clutter of, of online and advice coming from every corner. So stay focused on what's really in your heart and soul. And then apply a work ethic to it. Having these companies that you mentioned, yeah. I've hired and do hire quite a few people. Yeah. And so I get to see different generations of work ethics just by default. 
I'm not trying to conduct any kind of a study <laughs> on, you know, work ethics and, and generational habits, but it just turns out that way because you hire people of all different ages and, and skill sets. Absolutely. And I, I have seen over and over and over consistently that what's lacking in the younger people is a true work ethic yeah. and a true commitment to I'm going to give it everything that I have and trust in the faith that whatever deal I've made now and whatever goals I have later will be rewarded Absolutely. and not be so concerned about just getting away with the least and trying to get the most. It's like I worked for free yeah. for so many years. I don't think there'll ever be an amount of money I'll make through the different things I do that would ever compensate me for that right. in, a, in, a, in an hourly sense, right? right? right it just will right. never happen. Right, right, right. And so it, it just wasn't about that. It was about the fact that all of the different things I was able to achieve through goals and hard work were a result of, for me, I looked at those as opportunities. Yeah, I was working for free, but I was getting 10 times the value because I was working for John Keel at Soundtrack or, you know, d different artists and different opportunities yeah. that would be, that just had so much incredible mentoring and value. It saved me years of time and I would contribute all I could. And then they would get my, you know, my, con you know, what I would do, they would get without necessarily putting me on any kind of payroll, yeah, but yeah. I just wanted to be there. I just wanted the opportunity. Yeah. And it's such a lost mentality yeah. that I see. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I think that's really huge. I think that if you, I'm not saying don't be a business person and I'm not saying don't have contracts and don't have agreements. Of course you have to have all of right, that stuff. Right, right. What I'm saying is don't get lost in it before you have the, what the the ability and the polished art form to give back yeah, like yeah. i always looked at it like i'll be ready and then the rest will 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 be there you know like i'll contribute and i'll i'll have the goods and then whatever whatever i need will be you know will be there for me it's not it, it was never about anything it was never about the 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 end zone it's like i always looked at it like if I wanted to just make money, be a stockbroker yeah. or be a real estate investor or yeah. do things that have pretty predictable high rates of success monetarily. Right. 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 And like that's like right. that's the goal. I want to make money. I wanted to live my life through my passions and make money at that so that I could still do it. How beautiful. Beautiful. How and beautiful. that was the goal. And that's what I think I would advise a, a young person to look at and to say take uh you know take your your passion and what it is that you want to do and learn and insert yourself with the best people you can and the money and the opportunities and the growth will occur absolutely fantastic so heavily passion driven no necessary expectations from that other than just as long as you're following your heart and putting in incredible hard work that's where success will begin. Yes, and, and I want to, I'm driven to be successful. I, don't, I do not want to have anything fall short of a 10 or an 11. <laughs> if the scale's 1 to 10, the 10's the minimum. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, I should be more accepting. I should be more like, well, I gave it everything I had. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll crawl to the finish line. Yeah. I do have that drive. But I, that's I, that perseverance at the highest level. I, I just can't, I, I can't operate any other way. I can't, I th it comes from my parents. Yeah. It comes from early years of do it right or don't do it at all. Go big or go home. All of these philosophies yeah. that weren't just like about everybody gets a ribbon. Yeah. It was about you have to make it happen. Absolutely. You get results and then the path between the idea and the making it happen, you, st you persevere and you riddle it with all the things you love, but there's elements that go along, you know this as well as anybody yeah. through all your success, yeah. there's elements along the journey that you don't love. Absolutely. But 
you have to, they, they're part of the process. I mean, you look, at, you go to the gym. Do you love having your muscles ripped apart? <laughs> Probably not all the time if you love it at all, but you love what the outcome is. Yeah, the and results. you don't stop, yeah. you know. So there's that, there's that balance of like doing the work and dealing with the things you have to deal with, but then never stopping in your pursuit of passion to be as successful as you possibly can at it so that you can take that to the next level. Because the most inspiring thing is the wor in the world is just that next level, next level, next level. Yeah, like yeah. the mountains get higher, the challenges get new, the challenges get renewed. That's really the spirit of life to me. Absolutely. Well, your next level is crystal clear. It is, it is onward and upward, as I say. Yes. And you have found the balance of the business, but you also have the balance of a beautiful family mm -hmm. that is supportive of what you do. They are beautiful people, beautiful yeah. children. And you put this together in such a healthy way that plus you're giving back, David. You're giving back at such a high level. And that's really where the true gift is. For that, we thank you so much. You have thank done you. fantastic. Thank David. you. Fantastic. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everybody. Dom Famulari here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.